Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Shelley Freed, and he is a associate professor at Massachusetts General Hospital, and that's actually also linked with Harvard. And uh, he's done a lot of work with retinal prostheses. And then he's also, we, we also talk about kind of a non-contact microcoil implant, which uses electric fields to stimulate neurons. So I thought this was really interesting stuff. So I was very interested in talking to this unique person who does, you know, two kind of different things, you know, retinal prostheses and uh, novel electro designs. But I thought that was very cool. So yeah, enjoy. Shelly Freed, I actually don't know how to introduce you because, you know, I'm seeing stuff like, okay, Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at Mass- Massachusetts General Hospital, but then also you're in Harvard. Uh, so actually, can you can you clear that up a little bit? Wh- which one is it? Or is it both? Yeah, it's both. So I have appointments at both. I My lab is physically at Massachusetts General Hospital. Mass General Hospital was the first teaching hospital associated with Harvard Med School. So many of the faculty, many of the clinicians at Mass General, many of the folks at Mass General have Harvard appointments. So I am a member, I am not a, a tenured member of the Harvard Med School faculty, but I am a researcher at Harvard or Harvard Med School at Mass General and also at the VA. Like many universities, like many med centers, there's a lot of overlap between these, uh, between these appointments. Yeah, I haven't really done much stuff in med school. I haven't, you know, dabbled around in it too much, so uh, I don't know much about it. But uh, you do a lot of work with retinal prostheses, and uh, another one is also stimulation methods, basically with magnetic fields. But I want to, I want to start out with uh, the retinal prostheses. Do you want to talk about a little about your research and then how you got started in it as well? Yeah, so it's kind of a, a neat story, and it goes goes way back. You know, old enough that neural engineering really was was not much of a field when when I was seventeen, eighteen, thinking about college and all that. And somewhere in the middle of college, there was an article in the New York Times. Some of the early work being done, I don't remember. I think it was Dobell's work, trying to get these visual cortical prostheses in the brain of blind Vietnam veterans. A bunch of them had been blinded in combat injuries. They were sticking. Uh, electrodes into visual cortex of these folks, and they were trying to create pixelated vision. Grew up in New York. They had just installed the first digital score, digital uh, replay screen in, in center field in Yankee Stadium, and it was crude pixelated vision, but they made the analogy that that's what they were hoping to get with these blind folks. So it seems so cool to me, and that got me into the field of artificial vision. A couple of twists and turns along the way. I was in industry for for a dozen years or so, but went back to school to study specifically retinal prostheses, worked in the lab of a, a systems neurobiologist studying the retina, studying the circuitry of the retina. And f- from there, I got into the field. And then, yeah, actually, what do you think? I mean, uh, William Dobell, I mean, he was one of the pioneering people in the retinal space. And then actually, one of the first interviews on the show was Jens Naumann, who was one of the first implantees, and he was on Wired Magazine, drove a car, even though he's blind, and he had these retinal prostheses. So they had cortical prostheses. They had prostheses in the back of their brain, not, not, not in their eyes, right? Oh, okay. Well, and then, and then Dobell ended up dying in like 2001, I think, uh, I guess what what now that he's not around uh, what what is your opinion of him like was he too forward too brash or what was his research like I guess Yeah you know I'm not expert enough on him or on his research I mean he certainly was very forward he certainly he, he certainly seemed to push the limits of what could be done some of the the rumors and some of the stories I hear at nights you know just uh, talk amongst folks he you know he he bent some of the rules for clinical safety and all that. I think some of it's being studied right now. Some of their um, folks at uh, IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, are actually going through and interviewing all of DeBell's old patients. And I think the story's coming out or will be coming out shortly about some of the details. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm, I think I did talk to somebody like that. Okay, but I guess back to your work. So cortical processes, retinal processes, what's the difference if you, if you want to explain to the audience and how does your technology work? Sure. 
you know, there, there are many different types of visual prostheses, and they basically mirror the visual pathway. So, so light comes into the eye, the neural tissue at the back of the eye, of course, is the retina, and uh, retina stops functioning in, in some folks, mainly because of retinal degenerative diseases, things like retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration. So in those diseases, uh, they generally target the photoreceptors, which are the light transducers, the neurons that, that convert light photons into uh, neural signals, electrochemical signals that the rest of the retina and the rest of the brain can understand. When those photoreceptors are, are damaged with these diseases, the, the retina can no longer convert light into the neural signal. So the theory is that we can bring up uh, electrodes, we can bring in electrodes up close to the surviving neurons, the downstream neurons in, in the retina called bipolar cells or ganglion cells, put an electrode up against those those cells, stimulate them and activate those secondary neurons to, to send a neural signal to the brain. That received a lot of initial attention and effort. It's attractive because it's early on in the visual pathway where the neural signals are less abstract, less abstracted. And so we sort of understand a lot of the basic principles of how light is converted into a neural signal. So we can have computers, we can have uh, processors that that know roughly what the spiking patterns should be in these neurons. And so we can transduce, at least in a computer, we can we can create those patterns. The trick, of course, is converting those the spike patterns that we want to create, how to actually get those into to the ganglion cells. And then there's some selectivity that needs to be be accomplished. But it's an attractive it's an attractive model and that's received a lot of attention over the last 20 or 25 years. Just quickly to to go from there, in some folks, say a person with cancer in, in the eyes and, and the eyes actually have to be removed, they're obviously not a, a, a not a candidate for a retinal prosthesis. And so we have to stimulate further downstream in the visual pathway. So Part of the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus, is where the retinal neurons project to, and some folks have, have been working on devices to stimulate the LGN, as, as it's called, or the next way station after that is called primary visual cortex V1. It's the occipital lobe of the brain, and uh, there's been a lot of attention there. Dobell's done work, and there are a bunch of different folks uh, folks now studying that or trying to build a cortical prosthesis. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a lot of uh, excitement about that. But I remember hearing about the um, cortical processes that actually, you know, the, the neurons don't really come in, you know, neatly aligned. They all kind of get jumbled up and then the brain makes sense of it. So maybe the advantage of yours is that there is no de-jumbling required. And, you know, if you have a red light at this location, you can stimulate the red light at that location versus trying to figure it out later in the, in the cortex. Is that is that maybe the advantage of this that you see? Yeah, it's one of the advantages. So the retina is laid out, it's called retinotopic organization. Basically, it means what you just said, that that if we looked at a, a grid, a, a, a chessboard with squares, one, you know, the, the top row was one through eight, and the second row, nine through 16, etc. We looked at that, those neurons would all be organized one next to each other in, in the retina. You know, each each neuron processes a, di- a, a different region in space. It's not quite that simple, but it's very spatio- spatially aligned, very easy to replicate that. The, the challenge with the retina is it's so small. Our eye is about an inch in diameter, and so we've got to pack a lot, a lot of electrodes into a very tiny region, and, and central vision is even very, very, very densely packed, and it's hard even with current fabrication technology to get the electrodes that small so that we target individual neurons. But it's still it's still attractive from that point of view. Cortex is also organized what's called visual topically, so that adjacent regions in visual space correspond to adjacent regions in the cortex. So when we come up with a spatial array of electrodes, they're roughly targeting regions regions next to each other. It's a little more complex than that. The 3D topography of visual cortex is pretty complex. Part of the sulci and the the folds and the uh, hemispheres bend into the cortex away from the skull. And so it's challenging to get electrodes or the coils that we work with to actually lay out in this perfect grid. But the attractive part about cortex is that the uh, surface area is so large, it's it's easier. There's, There's more surface area to work with. Okay. And then your electrodes, they have to be put into the eye or are they put behind the eye? Or, I mean, that, that doesn't sound pleasant in any case. 
the eye itself, the re they are inserted into the eye. There are plenty of surgeries that actually can go into the eye. There's all sorts of routine procedures now that are that are done many times uh, a day in, in ophthalmologists' office all, you know, all across the country, all across the world. So, so that part sounds scary to, to somebody who's not in the field, but it's that, that's not the challenging part. There are a couple of different designs, but most designs until recently haven't thought about penetrating into the retina. They lay flat, either just behind the retina, or they actually get tacked into the front surface of the retina. So the front surface, the closest to the front surface of the eye is where the ganglion cells, the output neurons are. And so there's some attraction to putting electrodes right up close to those since they're the target. Other folks like the idea of putting it behind the retina of actually creating a little uh, bleb and, and, and getting the devices. They're flat sheets of, of uh, arrays, very, very thin, delicate sheets of electrodes, getting them right in behind the eye, closer to the presynaptic neurons, the bipolar cells, the eye itself, the structure of the eye then holds the electrodes nicely, firmly in place, and they can stimulate the presynaptic neurons, neurons presynaptic to the ganglion cells, and take advantage of the existing uh, synaptic circuits of, of the retina to try to shape the neural activity uh, to, to get it more, more in line with normal physiological signaling. So both are an option. There's also new options coming out of uh, Israel and out of Stanford devices to actually penetrate into the retina like a, like a bed of nails, like the old Utah array uh, that actually penetrates in to try to bring the, the, neuro, the electrodes closer to specific uh, target regions. And then you were talking about one of the advantages of this is that it's is easier to topically map, you know, the locations of, of all the neurons. Uh, would another advantage be that you don't have to crack open the skull? And I heard something like once the skull or once the brain is exposed to air, it's never the same, something like that. Yeah. So when I started in this field about 20 plus years ago, uh, one of the big advantages we used to write in our papers and grants was, yeah, the retinal prosthesis was the way to go because it wasn't, quote, brain surgery, you know. And in those 20 years, the field of deep brain stimulation has taken off. And now the, the skull has been opened 200,000, 300,000 times with these, with these devices. I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's, but it's pretty high. And so all of a sudden, brain surgery isn't so complex. It's done routinely at a lot of the university hospitals. These devices are, are put in and folks of the, the surgeons and the, the teams have gotten good in opening the skull, closing it. And there's been very, very, you know, uh, few cases of, of infection, very, very small incidents. Okay. Wow. And then you were saying that on the fovea, which is like the, the you know, the center, the focus point of the eye uh, that you're having trouble, like it's, it's not um, resolution even by modern technology to, to be able to get the kind of, I don't know, detail that, that one might expect. What kind of resolution are you getting and what could somebody see with that theoretically? Yeah. So the field is evolving fast. So let me just explain that the fovea, if we think about ganglion cells, just the outermost layer of ganglion cells, we tend to stereotypically think of the retina as multiple layers. So there's a layer of photoreceptors and they'll, they project to a layer of bipolar cells and then a, the output neurons are the ganglion cells. And we think about them as three separate layers and there are interneurons, inhibitory neurons that, that do all the shaping. But the uh, three separate layers is in the human retina, especially in the fovea region, we don't have a monolayer, single layer of ganglion cells, the cells that are so densely crammed together that, that ganglion cell somas can be stacked four, five, six, seven, I forget the exact amount, times on top of each other, right? So it's like a, a jar of marbles or something like that. So you can't lay a grid on top of, of seven ganglion cells and, and stimulate one of those selectively. The, the, the grid approach just doesn't work anymore. There has to be better ways to target them. So that's where we lose that, that resolution, right? The neurons themselves are about 10 microns. Uh, the ganglion cell somas in that region are 10 to 15 microns in diameter. So if they were a monolayer, they're actually small, uh, large enough. I don't know which, which adjective to use. Uh, we, current technology can build electrodes 15 microns in diameter, 10 microns in diameter. They're small enough that we can match that. Getting all the wires out and, and uh, there are hundred. Um, a million ganglion cells, uh, devices that that can can that work with a, a million separate channels. That that's some of the challenge right now, as opposed to the physical size of the neurons themselves. So you asked a 
couple of questions there. I'll, I'll answer the, the second part to that with current devices. The best that, that there are folks are seeing is somewhere in the range of, you know, 2020 is perfect vision and then 2040 is twice as bad, 2080 is twice as bad as that. And by the time you get to 2200, you're legally blind. So the best reported vision that I think we're seeing now is about 2500, 2550. I think Second Sight is one of the for-profit companies that was one of the pioneers in the field. They had a patient with 2500 about a maybe 550. Eberhardt's Renner and the, the team in tubing in Germany also had a patient there. And um, now Dan Palanker and the group at Stanford, I think they're reporting also some patients that are seeing in the range of 2,500. So that's still pretty limited. It doesn't give patients high quality vision. They can't read a newspaper or make out shapes too well. It's amazing if you're blind, if you have no light perception and all of a sudden you can see something. Some of the folks really like it, but many of the folks who, who get that level of vision are, are disappointed by it. So the trick is to, to get the electrodes closer together, to get more electrodes in and to find ways to, to narrowly activate, use each electrode to activate a narrow region of, of the retina so that we can get higher acuity. Yeah, I mean, 2,500 doesn't sound very good. I mean, basically be able to see very broad shapes and, and you know, very <laughs> bright things, maybe something like that. But uh, yeah, so what have some been some of the challenges in this research? Yeah, you know, so it's, it's uh, slow. It's physiological research. Um, if you would have told me 25 years ago that we take out a retina, which is like a uh, a wet piece of single ply Kleenex tissue, you know, very thin, very fragile. We take it out, we can put it in a dish, we can put an electrode and patch onto a single cell or put the electrode on top of a single cell and study how it responds to stimulation or do experiments in, in mice where we get electrodes into their eye or rats and get electrodes. It's amazing, right? This this technology. It's challenging. It's it's cutting edge. So just getting some of those experiments to work have have proven very very challenging, right? So we spent a lot of years just just developing that. The field of of retinal prostheses, you know, just building these devices, uh, engineering them so that they're stable, so that they can be safely implanted, developing the surgery so that it does no harm. Getting these in was took. You know, long periods of time, 10, 15 years, and a lot of funding, uh, multiple grants, multiple donations, benefactors, uh, huge contributions from, from some wealthy folks to get it in the eyes of patients and to just see if it would work. And over time, we did that. And uh, we, the field, uh, done at Second Sight, uh, Zerner, Joe Rizzo, and the group in Boston did it, Dan Palanker now, and Pixium and Groups uh, based out of Paris are doing it. A couple of groups around the world. Australians had a, had a project, have a project on this as well. Nigel and and Greg. So a lot of research going on on this, and leaving plenty of them out. But the um, uh, the challenge has been we've put these into the eye, and I think the hope was that people were going to see better than this. They were going to get more useful vision than they're actually getting. As you mentioned before, 2,500 isn't all that great. Some folks love it. Some users absolutely love it. And to me, it sounds pretty, pretty crude, but I have fairly normal vision. You know, I think the the real folks to ask are, are blind folks. And, you know, you're qualified to answer what good vision is if you want to keep your eyes closed. You know, close your eyes, keep them closed for a year or two, and then you can to determine what, you know, what, what useful vision would be. Some folks like it a lot, but most folks don't. So the, the challenge in the field is there was a lot of time and effort and funding and companies and uh, academic research and all sorts of uh, collaborations. And we get to this point and, and folks just um, the, the vision isn't good enough for, for most of the folks that, that were getting it. So Second Sight and Zrenner, both of those companies, I think Second Sight uh, stopped making the retinal prosthesis a couple of months ago. And then I think I heard recently that they, they may be shutting down operations completely. They were trying to, to build the a cortical device, but I think they're, they're backing away from that now. Zrenner and the Alpha IMS team in, in Germany we're struggling with Europe with different regulations for each country. The market was small, profits were were small, and it just was complex and it just wasn't commercially viable. So there's that whole challenge there that that we have to make the device good enough that it can be used. And I think the getting this to work for folks with retino, retinitis is pigmentosis uh, is you know a major accomplishment would be great. But just commercially, the, the amount of folks that have retinitis pigmentosis is a lot smaller than those that have macular degeneration. So for macular degeneration, 
a lot of uh, macular. The, the, the difference is retinitis pigmentosa tends to cause blindness initially in the outer portions of the retina, and then eventually it spreads to the inner retina. And uh, the, the folks that were targeted with these devices or were implanted with these devices are folks who had bare or no light perception whatsoever. Macular degeneration is a disease that targets the foveal portion of, of the retina and, and destroys the uh, cones there. And so it leaves folks with peripheral vision. They still have some limited ability to see, but they can't read newspaper. They can't see detail. They can't drive. They, they've lost that, that key central part of the vision. So if you want to build a device for macular degeneration, a lot of those folks are already seeing at levels of 2,500 or 2,600 or 2,800 or some at 2,400. So a device now has to be a lot better. It has to be uh, provide a lot higher level of acuity. Electrodes have to be closer together. And not only putting the electrodes closer together, we need to be able to figure out how to confine activation to very, very narrow regions. So there are a couple approaches now that that seem to have made some progress in that area. The Stanford group uh, has some encouraging results, and I've heard that the group uh, group in Israel has some encouraging results in that area. So uh, Second Sight and uh, the FM IMS group in, uh, in Germany may not uh, be leading the way anymore, but there are new efforts coming out. So still big challenges. The work that I do in, in particular, I'm talking about the, the field in general there, but it's understanding... Um, the lab focus is one of the focuses of the lab. It's understanding uh, why retinal neurons respond to stimulation. What are the biophysics of activation? What makes a neuron respond? Does an alpha neuron respond differently than a beta neuron or midget parasol neurons? Do on cells respond differently than off cells? Because as, as I think most of the listeners will know or will have remembered, uh, in the normal retina, there are heterogeneous populations of neurons. So on and off cells, for example, when a bright light goes on in part of the visual field, the on cells respond with a lot of spikes and the off cells stay quiet. And so we need a system that can activate on cells without simultaneously activating off cells. So I study those mechanisms. The goal is to, to get the prosthesis to be able to recreate natural signaling better than they currently do and to, to be able to confine activation. The hope is that this will help these, these devices get to the next level of performance. Wow. So you're probably, I mean, it sounded, sounded kind of bad in the beginning, like, oh, all these companies are, you know, not you know, functional or like, you know, they're, they're, they might not be um, viable anymore, but there are others to pick up the baton behind them. So it's not like a lost cause. It's not like there's the, this field is in the doldrums for, you know, potentially the next decade or something like that, right? Yeah, I don't I don't think that that's the case at all. In fact, I think some of the, the more exciting work is, is coming down uh, the road. This is not quick. It's not something we say we're going to build a new retinal prosthesis and be on the market in clinical trials a few years. It takes years and years and a lot, a lot of funding. So yeah, the group at Stanford made remarkable, more remarkable progress. And then Pixium got involved and handled the translational elements of that. And it's been, it's been great how fast they've moved. And I don't know the, the clinical results yet from nano retina, but they've been trying to build a device as well. And I've heard they have encouraging results. I haven't seen any of the papers or any of the details yet. So I, I can't comment just other, other than to say I'm aware of it. Yeah. And I'm actually, I'm looking at what it means to be, you know, 2,500 or, you know, 20. So I guess uh, the eye, the eye exam that you do at the optometrist with, you know, the, the E at the beginning, you know, the letters get progressively smaller. I guess that E at the top or, or whatever letters at the top, that's 2,200. So I guess it would be two times bigger and that would be 20, 2,400 or 2,500 or uh, thereabouts. So that's actually not too bad, I guess. I mean, you know, if you can make out something, as you said, like that's not, that's not bad at all. Like that's much better than being blind, I guess. Yeah. It's um, when, when I first approached this project 20 years ago, I was first thinking about it purely from an engineering point of view, you know, I was thinking thousands of channels and we'd get this to 2020 and they'd go to the museum and appreciate Renoir and all no, I, I think that, that we're pretty far away from that. I think if they can see fairly crude shapes or they can detect letters, see letters fairly rapidly, I think that would be amazing. If they can, the, the goal of a lot of the, the blind folks, if you speak to them, they're looking to resume the activities of daily living. They're looking to be able to, to be independent, to be able to get around their house, to see things and see obstacles, to, to be able to walk to the store or get to the store by themselves and buy coffee or buy milk or buy, buy, whatever it is they need to, to do laundry and be able to uh, do some of that basic stuff that, that's there. There are all sorts of phone apps now that'll read something for them that'll 
tell them what's in front of them. That'll tell them what currency, uh, you know, what the denomination of a of a uh, a bill is in front of them. So so the apps can handle, I think, a lot of the high resolution detail. But the independence is is what a lot of them are looking for. Yeah, I guess not being hit by a car crossing the street or something like that. And, you know, you can maybe do reading with something else. But yeah, I guess this is definitely a step in the right direction. Being able to look and see, tell that that's your granddaughter and, you know, the, the, the shorter person approaching you is your granddaughter and the taller person is your son. And being able to just know where they are without having to locate from the, the sound, I think, is, is uh, of great interest to them as well. That's pretty exciting. So, okay, so we talked about one of your aspects of your research, but I'm also very curious. I'm actually probably more interested and more curious about your other one, which is basically non-contact neural stimulation, and you achieve this using microcoils and magnetic fields. Do you want to explain this a little bit? Sure. So the use of electrodes in, in the brain has been around for for close to 100 years. It's well known. The Utah array has been around forever. And these work fairly well, but there's all sorts of concerns about stability. And there are all sorts of concerns about the engineering properties of the, these materials, charge density limitations, adverse reactions in the brain, foreign body responses can cause gliosis. Does that stop these devices from working over the time? Uh, there are separate concerns when the electrodes are used for recording and separate when they're used for stimulation, but, but a number of concerns with this. And aside from all the safety and all the fundamental engineering concerns, there's also a concern about selectivity. So uh, if we think about stimulating the visual cortex or any sensory cortex, we want activity from a single electrode to be confined to a narrow region around that electrode, right? If we're going to create good pixelated vision, we need good focal activation from individual electrodes, right? We need it to be separate to not overlap. So there have been studies at a Clay Reads group and others that have looked at activation in the visual cortex from these implanted electrodes and found that it isn't focal and it spreads. It can be uh, inconsistent, it can be diffuse, it can be sparse. And so electrodes aren't very good at, at getting perfect focal activation. So there's more work underway and, and, and some approaches may be better than others, but there's that general concern. And part of the reason is has to do with the architecture of the cortex. So we think that the neurons that we want to stimulate when we insert an electrode into cortex are these pyramidal neurons, these projection neurons that send information to other parts of the brain and other, uh, other parts of visual cortex, other parts of the brain. So what we don't want to activate, we think, are these uh, these pyramidal neurons are verti vertically oriented. Essentially, they're perpendicular to the cortical surface. When we stick an electrode in, there are also uh, what are called uh, horizontal processes or passing axons that uh, generally run in the horizontal direction. And if we activate those, those are the, the cables that are carrying signals from distant regions and to distant regions. So if we activate horizontal axons, we get this big spread of activation. If we can combine it to pyramidal neurons, we get local activation. The problem is that electrodes don't do a good job at confining activation to pyramidal neurons. We know that we uh, axons are very, very sensitive to stimulation. And so we see this spread of activation. Clay readers saw it first, and we did some testing with uh, uh, calcium signals, and we can see the, the spread of activation. It's not really surprising to, to anybody just how much it spreads. So the theory of coils, Pilks have known that magnetic stimulation can activate the, the brain for a long time. There's a famous picture of Thompson sitting between two giant coils the size of his head that he was using for stimulation. In the modern era, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, four-inch electrodes sit on the outside of the, outside of the skull. They generate a strong magnetic field that goes in and activates some cortical neuron, and they're being uh, it's being used now to, to treat depression and other neurological disorders. So it, it's known that magnetic stimulation can activate. What we showed was that the coils can actually be shrunk down to tiny levels, small enough to be implanted into the cortex and that they can still safely activate neurons. So the fields get tiny when, when uh, we shrink the coils down, but it turns out that the field isn't so important for activating these neurons. It's actually the spatial gradient of the field. So if we think about a single uh, pyramidal neuron extending vertically in space, if we can create a relatively large gradient of a field uh, along the length of that neuron, we can induce activation. This has been known for a while. Frank Rattay in Austria developed this whole theory called the activating function, and it's basically the, the uh, second degree of a uh, second derivative of voltage, or the the first uh, the, the spatial derivative of the, the field induced by an electrode. So we found with these coils that they can activate a very very strong field or a supra threshold field, something that's strong enough along the length of the pyramidal neuron, and we can activate them. 
So we were pretty surprised when we did this. The, the calculations, the initial calculations that we did suggested it would be super threshold, but we did all sorts of, of control experiments. You know, we made sure that the coils weren't leaking any electricity. We, you know, did impedance testing of the coils to make sure that uh, there was no path for current to uh, to leak out. We did temperature measurements. We did capacitive things. We rotated the the uh, coils in all sorts of directions to make sure it was. And we found that that these coils can can actually be quite effectively activate neurons. And now a couple of other groups have been doing this in different parts of the body as well. So uh, it's fairly well established that, that the coils are working. How does the volume of uh, the stimulation compare to the volume of stimulation with arrays or electrodes? How does the volume that gets activated by stimulation compare? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's amazing. So uh, we have a couple of papers out there. We had a first paper with uh, Sun Wu Lee as the first author who um, who looked at a uh, – we took a brain slice from a um, – GCAMP6 mouse, a mouse that's genetically modified so that it has uh, neurons that have a fluorescent protein in there, and that fluorescent protein becomes activated when the cell spikes. So we can look at large populations of neurons simultaneously, and we can put an electrode up, and we put the electrode up, almost the whole sheet of, of tissue becomes activated, even for very modest levels of stimulation. When we do it with a coil, we get activation confined to a couple hundred microns, maybe 100 microns, 200 microns, or a single cortical column. So uh, just in that two-dimensional sheet, we see uh, a stimulation extending for 100 or 200 microns with coils and millimeters, a millimeter or two with electrodes. We're doing work now where we look at how that signal is projecting local activation, is projecting to other regions of the brain, and the magnification of, of the effect seems to be even more dramatic. So if we look at ECOG, if we look at the response on the surface of the brain, it's even worse for electric stimulation than it is for magnetic stimulation. In other words, the discrepancy gets even larger the, the further we get away from the stimulation site. So it's it's uh, very, very significantly different. And uh, I mean, how big are they too? And you said they had to be in the cortex or they had to be, you had to crack open the skull to be able to get to it, or could you have this on the surface or what is the geometry of this look like, I guess? Yeah, so uh, right now these are invasive. So most folks think of magnetic stimulation as transcranial magnetic. It's non invasive. It's using inductive activation to go through the skull. We're not doing that. We're, we're treating this, we're building these coils. The coils themselves are actually simple bends in a wire. So if we take a micro wire, we fold it in half to, we'll call it a V shape or a U shape. We can use that V or U and penetrate that into the cortex. If we take a 15 micron wire or a 25 micron wire, we fold it in half. Its proton, its profile, its cross-sectional proton profile is 15 by 30 or 25 by 50. So that's the surface area that actually gets inserted into the cortex. And we can do that into uh, mouse or or monkey brain without uh, without damaging uh, without damaging the tissue. Wow, that's a uh, that's pretty incredible. But I know for um, you know junkyards, they have like those giant electromagnets, and you know they they basically turn on a current and you know generate a magnetic field. And like always in the movies, like there's somebody stuck in a car and they're putting be put in the crusher or something like this. But those magnets take a lot of energy, like a lot, a very very high current. Your devices are much much smaller, so maybe they don't need such a, a big current. Is that an issue potentially? Yeah, so it is right now. I think that that's one of the the big challenges that uh, that we face moving forward. So uh, if you put a, an electrode into the cortex, into visual cortex, and you try to elicit a, a percept in a human or a primate, it takes currents on the order of uh, a few tens of microamps, depending on how perfectly or how optimally the, coil, uh, the electrode is designed and how optimally it's placed. But generally, the literature has numbers from about 10 to 100 microamps to we're using on the order of milliamps. So we're finding, depending on a couple of factors, it's somewhere between five and one or 200 milliamps to elicit a response. Now, our initial measurements were higher. We were fi consistently finding hundreds of milliamps, and we've done a lot of different design iterations and found that we could get down to about 100 or a couple of tens of, of milliamps in, in most applications. We're still doing our work in heavily anesthetized animals, so it's tough to get behavioral responses or motor responses out of these folks. So we're in the process of now shifting over to in vivo testing so we can get rid of the anesthesia and find out what the what the real thresholds are. 
I want to make two points before I finish answering the question. And one is, I'll just remind you and everybody else that these currents are not currents that are being deposited in the brain like they are with electric stimulation, where a five microgram current is you know, in direct contact with cortical tissue. This is purely flowing through the wire so that there's no contact with the surface. There's no deposition of any of these, uh, of these currents or charges into the brain. The second point is that the overall power may not be as problematic as it, as it might sound. And the reason is that the resistance, the impedance of the coils are actually much, much lower than electrodes. So typical electrodes have, have resistances or impedances somewhere in the 100K to 1 meg or even 2 meg range, depending on their size. So our, the impedance of our, elect, uh, of our coil is on the order of 5 to 10 ohms. So those impedances, we're, we're using an order of magnitude more, uh, three orders of magnitude more more current, but we're five to six orders of magnitude uh, lower resistance. So if you do the I squared R, they're still lower than we are, but I think where coils are uh, comparable, at least I squared R power. These current levels are still too high, they've got to come down, but I think the real goal is to see do these work? Do these give a noticeably better percept or can they confine activation better? And does that translate into uh, better vision? If I could blink and do the test, we'd love to get these into the brains of some blind folks, do a side-by-side -side comparison with electrodes and see if they give better visual percepts. The, the point of all that is if they did give better visual percepts, I think we would continue to work with electromagnetic experts and work to translate these things, I think we could get power way down. For example, we could put uh, cores in the center of inductors that greatly, greatly amplify the magnetic fields. That might that might allow us to greatly reduce power by, by several orders of magnitude. So I think there are ways to do it, but we're still early on in that research. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it does sound like, yeah, power power draw could be a, an issue. And especially if you're using a battery pack, that could very, very quickly drain the battery pack. But uh, I guess I guess power through the electrode is, is much lower, as you were saying. So that that would probably also mean that heat is less of an issue than with electrodes. And, and we don't even think of heat as an issue with electrodes, right? Yeah, it's always a concern with electrodes, but there's been enough testing and, and uh, stability testing over time, and uh, it hasn't been an issue. There's there's not heat damage that, that's coming there. And all the testing we've done with heat so far with the coils, we don't see uh, heat damage as well. But obviously, we're we're a lot earlier in the process than than electrodes that have been tested, you know, over decades. And then, so what do you see the future with this? What do you want to do with these uh, microcoil electrodes? Yeah, so there are a couple of things. So th the fact that we can selectively target, the fact that we can confine activation, the fact that we, we expect these devices to stay stable, we think are pretty important advantages. So it doesn't mean that they're better. There's a lot more testing that we want to do, but the hope is to to get these and translate these to, to actually, we're, we're working to get them into a very, very limited clinical trial. First, we want to do an intrasurgical test, make sure that we can go in, that we can generate power, that we can do it safely on a, on a surgical patient, uh, work on some tissue right before it's resected, work on some cortical tissue right before it's resected. And if that works, I think the answer is to, as I said before, try it in a limited set of blind subjects. Uh, insert the coil, see if we get better better spatial patterns of activity, see if the, uh, if the folks can see higher acuity, if they see more round phosphines that get assembled into, into percepts more readily. And if they do, I think we want to charge forward with the engineering development of that. I don't think we want to spend 10 years um, optimizing the engineering development of this and then find out that it, it isn't much better than electrodes. I, I think the way to go is try to get an inkling first of, of what the clinical benefit of this is and then run with it. That's in the, the visual world. We're also testing it in a couple of other applications where, where we think it might have some advantages. For example, uh, existing cochlear prostheses work very, very well, but the challenge there is that the signal from the electrode has to get through this bony wall of the cochlea, through the bony wall of the scalar tympani. And so uh, an inductive field might be more advantageous. There's, uh, it, it's well known that fields from adjacent electrodes in the cochlear prosthesis overlap. And so we're thinking that we can put the coils closer together and, and get non-overlapping activation. We have some preliminary evidence that suggests it's the case. So I think there are potential applications, many other potential neural engineering applications, but these are the uh, first one or two that we're looking at. We'll see if we can uh, get these to work and then we can consider other ones down the road. 
Yeah, that's really exciting stuff, you know, and I, I really hope that you you are able to, you know, show this and, and again, test it. I mean, we're scientists, so we want to see the data. But yeah, I actually didn't ask, um, what what was the genesis of the uh, microcoils? Was it inspired by the retinal prosthesis? Yeah, I wish that was the case. It wasn't. So um, we, we um, worked in the hospital. We were approached by one of the physicists in the imaging center who works with TMS. He was interested in a magnetic implant for deep brain stimulation. There were concerns about bringing existing implants into scans, into MRIs, and that uh, you know many of these patients who need these devices have other, have other deficiencies as well, and they need uh, medical services. And so there were safety issues about bringing somebody with uh, a DBS implant. And so he thought with a coil-based device, there may be ways to, to make it more safe. And so he had the theoretical part, but he had no evidence and we were able to to run with that and he has since run his name's Giorgio Balmasar he's since run with with uh, I believe he's running with it in the in the field of DBS we were visual prosthesis guys and we were interested in that and I was talking to uh, my postdoc at the time Sung Woo Lee and we were thinking about how to get the coils the coils that he would develop were miniature inductors they were a millimeter in size they were still pretty big and Sung Woo and I were chatting and we had the the back and forth conversation. We were working with a couple of other folks and I forget the actual genesis, but the thought was that the a simple bend might give us a local, locally strong field. Sungwoo really gets the credit for championing it and running with it. You know, he uh, built the first coil, he bought some microwire, bent it, and it was advantageous that our lab l- runs a lot of uh, uh, physiological experiments routinely. So we were able to bring this up to a piece of, of retinal tissue and then brain tissue and test it and see that it actually worked. So uh, that, that was the start of it. Good idea and run with it, I guess, huh? And then I, I was thinking too, an advantage of the microcoil could be that you could change the location of the stimulation and it could be either by moving the actual coil which would be, of course, less damaging to the brain than moving an electrode. Or, I, I mean, this is something we had talked about last year, you know, at the Bioelectronic Medicine Forum was, you know, you could have an array and, and have kind of like superposition of a few different electrodes and then just turning on and off certain electrodes could change the the location of the field or even the, the intensity of the field at certain locations. Is this something that is still, do you think is possible or is it just like way, way out there? No, absolutely. So, uh, Sung Woo Lee has a grant from NIH to do some testing on this. And one of the things he's looking into is the interaction between multiple coils. You know, how do we get these? How do they add? Uh, what, what are the, uh, there's not a theory built up yet for how induced electric fields from coils or induced gradients of electric fields from coils from neighboring coils add up and how do we get those to add up? And so we are, uh, we're doing a bunch of modeling and then we're doing the, the physiological experiments that support that, but it's absolutely where we want to go. You know, ideally is if we could, uh, if these are strong enough and we get them to work, it would be ideal to start taking the coils outside of the brain, make them not implantable, make them sit on the surface of the cortex or even outside the uh, outside the skull would be ideal. I think the fields aren't going to be strong enough and we make them stronger. They won't be focal enough, but we want to see how multiple coils interact to see if we can use that to, to get percepts. We know already that if we flow the current through the coil in one direction versus the other direction, we get two different focal regions of activation, you know, side by side, one on one side of the U, one on the other side of the U. And so we get two separate phosphines from each individual implant. So I think there are some additional advantages of this approach. We'll still have to test them and eventually test them clinically and see if they really produce, really translate to to, uh, separate phosphines that that can be added up. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I I definitely see a lot of benefits in this. So I think it's really cool and it's definitely something that should be explored. Want to be respectful of your time. Uh, Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? Uh, we covered a lot of things. I feel like I've been talking for a long, long time. So, uh, so yeah, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Thanks again for asking me, and I apologize again for for missing those first two times. I appreciate your your patience and your forgiveness. Hey guys, hopefully you enjoyed that. I really liked it. I mean, uh, we met last year in. Um, Bioelectronic Medicine Forum, you know, put on by Neurotech Reports, our good friends 
Jim Cavuto and Jennifer French. And, uh, you know, he was talking about uh, his his research and everything like this and, and, you know, seeing if it would be able to be translated. And, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit and I thought it was very interesting stuff. And then also the lab that I was in, uh, Auto Lab at University of Florida, they have been doing a lot of work with it too. So uh, it's been interesting to talk to everybody about it. And yeah, I just, I, I think it's, I think it's cool. I think it definitely has a lot of advantages over, you know, putting an electrode in the brain, like like shoving it in the brain, and it could have very good specific use cases. So yeah, very interesting stuff. This is a little bit on the longer side of things, but I kind of see that as a good thing. You know, sometimes I have somebody computational on and I'm just like, oh no, I don't know what to ask. I'm not very good at this. But yeah, with something like this, I feel a little bit more comfortable, you know, kind of manufacturing of electrodes and, and you know, retinal prosthesis. I think, I think it's all pretty interesting. And, you know, all these episodes are kind of building on each other, you know. So if you haven't heard some of these episodes, especially, you know, the ones by, one by Jens Nauman and in, in I don't know what that is, episode three or something like that, all the way in the beginning a few years ago, I, I would take a listen to that because that was pretty interesting stuff. That's one of the the biggies, you know, I, I would say the the highlights or the, the, the best of for the podcast. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And yeah, till next time. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.